Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. And at question number one, I call Donald Cameron. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on a deposit return scheme. Minister Lorna Slater. Circularity Scotland is now at an advanced stage of building the infrastructure and logistics network that will underpin the scheme. Sites have been secured across Scotland to handle and process material. Counting equipment and vehicle fleets are arriving. Recruitment is underway to recreate 500 new jobs in Scotland in processing and logistics. Likewise, businesses of all sizes are continuing to make good progress as they prepare for launch in August of this year. Deposit return is a transformational step change on our road to net zero, and businesses here in Scotland have the momentum needed to get us there. Donald Cameron. Um, small producers in the Highlands and Islands, especially craft brewers, including Fine Ales and the Glen Spean Brewery, are deeply concerned about the many unanswered questions that remain about DRS, including how the contractor BIFA will collect materials from rural and remote locations that are hard to reach. Given these legitimate concerns, why won't the Minister pause the introduction of DRS until these matters have been fully resolved, or at the very least, grant smaller producers a grace period before joining the scheme? Minister. Uh, I thank the member very much for the question. I take the concerns of small producers very seriously. And this week, Circularity Scotland announced a package of measures to specifically answer some of the pro uh, concerns raised by small producers in terms of cash flow and labelling. The process of the organisation and logistics is a matter of co-design between businesses to ensure, and, and BIFA, the logistics partner, to ensure that it works for everybody. And that will be going forward. And I will be meeting with producers, small producers, again this afternoon to find out what else we can do to support them. Fiona Hislop. While well, I welcome recent changes on fees for small drink producers and other improvements to the planned rollout of DRS, some businesses in my constituency are still concerned about implementation at a time of other serious economic pressures and have practical concerns about storage space and cost pressures. Although the aims of DRS are understood with widespread acknowledgement of the need for it, does the Minister recognise this continued uncertainty and how is she planning to address this and what practical changes has her very recent meetings with industry produced. Minister. I understand that implementing DRS is a big change to manage, particularly for small businesses. I've regularly been meeting industry stakeholders throughout the process. We've simplified the return point exemption process as a result of feedback from retailers, particularly around concerns around storage, and Circularity Scotland announced a package of support this week to improve cash flow for producers, which equates to £22 million of support. This was in direct response to specific asks from small producers. I will continue to meet businesses and listen to them, and later today I am meeting with a group of small producers. Mark Cruskell. Thank you. Can I ask whether the claim made by some MSPs operating curbside collections along DRS would be unlike any other country in the world is accurate, and how the Minister would like to see councils respond to DRS? Minister. Uh, thank the member very much for the question. Those claims are indeed inaccurate. Many countries operating a deposit return scheme also have curbside collections, including Norway, Germany, Croatia and Iceland. Our scheme will mean that local authorities will have less waste to handle, as well as reduced litter and associated clean-up costs, which is good for residents and good for council budgets. We are supporting local authorities to prepare for the introduction of the scheme, and our £70 million Recycling Improvement Fund is supporting councils to modernise recycling services. Question number two, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many free bicycles it has issued to children in Glasgow. Minister Patrick Harvey. Our commitment to encourage our younger citizens to make active travel choices by providing free bikes for children of school age who can't afford them was initially met through nine pilots which have operated since summer 2021. An independent evaluation on the pilots was published on the 27th of January this year. And the total bikes issued is 3,650, including 52 adapted bikes. The free bikes activity has taken place in 20 local authority areas, including Glasgow, though we don't record data at a local authority level. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Minister for that answer. Roads in Glasgow are in disrepair, with potholes so big some may be asking for submarines, not bikes. And the Avenues project, designed for cycling, wheeling, walking and driving, also has safety concerns. In all the safety of our roads, for cyclists is left wanting to say the least. 
So can I ask the Minister, given the variation in approaches and the flexibility given to pilot schemes, what steps will it ensure to ensure a minimum level of safety equipment or training is provided to children receiving bikes as part of the future national rollout? Minister. Well, in order to ensure uh, safety for everyone uh, travelling actively, we do need to reduce the barriers to active travel. We also need to continue to invest in safe infrastructure, and this government is doing that on a scale beyond anything Scotland has ever seen. Uh, but as Pam Duncan Glancy rightly says, we also need to ensure that there's a wider package of support. All the pilots uh, issue safety equipment uh, to the, the children who have been provided with uh, a bicycle, and the range of models of pilots uh, also need to be uh, informing the de design of the, the national scheme. The, that's why the evaluation of these pilots will be important and useful information uh, in making sure that our national scheme is as successful as possible. Question number three, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what additional funding it will provide to local authorities in response to a reported concern about swimming pool closures. Minister Tom Arthur. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of ensuring that community hubs such as swimming pools are accessible to the people of Scotland. Access to swimming pools can give children the opportunity to learn to swim, a life skill that can save lives. But we also understand the challenging financial circumstances faced by local authorities, largely due to the cost of living crisis. Our settlements from the UK Government have suffered a decade of austerity. In the most challenging budget settlement since devolution, we are providing over £13.3 billion in the local government settlement for 2023-24. Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you. Uh, my constituents, uh, Louis Condy, brought a, a fourth petition, PE 1891, to make swimming lessons a statutory requirement in the primary school's curriculum. It was very disappointing that this petition was closed in January 23. And now, potential swimming pool closures present further obstacles to providing crucial swimming lessons to children across Scotland. Swimming pools are vital community hubs for the population of Scotland. They provide crucial water safety skills, teaching more than 100,000 children each week the essential life skills of learning how to swim. They also act as part of Scotland's natural health service by safeguarding mental and physical well-being for all ages and invalidities. This, this, serves the NH, this that saves the NHS an essential 357 million every year. Will the Minister support swimming pool operators in keeping these vital community hubs open to provide this essential service? Minister. Uh, let me thank Mr Stroundry for his supplementary. Let me agree with him about the power of the preventative impact um, that swimming and indeed all physical health and exercise brings. The Scottish Government have been working with Scottish Swimming, Education Scotland, Sports Scotland and Scottish Water to develop interventions and approaches to provide opportunities for children to become confident, safer and competent swimmers. Touching on this particular point, under the provisions of Curriculum for Excellence, schools and education authorities have the flexibility to decide upon the content of their lessons and at the local authority level, taking into account the local needs and circumstances of all children and young people in attendance. Additionally, the Scottish Government will continue to work with Sports Scotland, our national agency for sport, to accurately understand the current swimming pool provision, life cycle and predict the landscape in the short, medium and long term to ensure that current and future generations have the opportunity to realise the benefits of swimming. Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, 57 people accidentally drowned in Scotland last year, predominantly young people. Uh, the plan the Scottish Government has to half accidental drownings by 2026 was announced four years ago, but deaths last year rose to their highest level since 2015. What impact does the Minister think the closure of swimming pools across Scotland is going to have on that? Minister. Well, I absolutely um, recognise the importance of doing all we can to ensure that we promote water safety and that all people have the opportunity to be as equipped with the vital life-saving skills of swimming. Ultimately, decisions around local authority pools are a matter for local authorities. Under an exceptionally challenging fiscal settlement, we are providing £13.3 billion for local government in the coming, in the coming financial year. Uh, we have now passed the budget, but as was um, made very clear numerous times in that process, if members wish to see additional resource and funding for local authorities, it was incumbent upon members to identify that, where that funding should come from. 
Um, and I think, as Parliament realises, there were no credible alternative proposals put forward, and Parliament has subsequently passed the budget. Okay, thank you. Um, concise questions and responses appreciated as ever. Question number four, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the Scottish Prison Service regarding the lifting of all COVID-19 related restrictions in prisons. Minister Eleanor Whitton. The Scottish Government receives regular updates from the Scottish Prison Service on COVID-19 recovery within prisons. The only remaining restrictions are testing pathways and isolation for those who are symptomatic or test positive, as set out in the SPS COVID-19 transition plan. In the event of an outbreak, further restrictions can be reinstated. The Prison Service is prioritising restoration to further rehabilitative regimes, whilst balancing the need to protect the health and well-being of those living, visiting and working in our prisons. Pauline McNeill. I raise this question because on November 22, uh, HM Chief Inspector of Prisons of Scotland, Wendy Sinclair Gibbon, noted in an annual report that there was now no reason why prisons can't return to regimes at least as open as they were before the pandemic. And I know the Minister supports the view that it's particularly important in relation to routine access to fresh air. And today the Scottish Prison Service website still refers to a transition plan from July 22, and it was due to be reviewed in October 22. No statement has since been made about lifting all of the restrictions, and there is no way of knowing which regimes have remained and which have reverted to pre-pandemic status. So I wonder if the interests of transparency and human rights concerns, will the Minister agree that it is time for the Scottish Prison Service to make it absolutely clear as to when all restrictions plan to be lifted? Minister. I thank Pauline McNeill for that question. And despite the required caution taken in around the lifting of the COVID-19 restrictions, given the close nature of the prisons, we are very aware of the reports um, that she does reference. Operations S um, the SPS Operations Directorate are in the process of collating information from establishments to establish if any further support may be required to maximise purposeful activity within each establishment. And we will seek to keep members informed. Question number five, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on improvements to rail journeys in Fife. Jenny Gilruth. As a frequent user of ScotRail's Fife Rail Services, I am aware of the challenges with the operation of the current timetable. This has been compounded by the poor performance and availability of diesel trains in ScotRail's fleet, on which Fife Services are dependent. ScotRail will review Fife Service provision in the next phase of the Fit for the Future timetable exercise to make sure that lessons are learnt from the current performance. And as part of that review, the member has been invited to a meeting I am hosting with Fife MSPs and ScotRail to discuss these matters in more detail. Annabel Ewing. I thank the Minister for her answer and I very much welcome the Minister's commitment to include five rail service provision within the next timetable review and I look forward indeed to the meeting offered by the Minister. But can the Minister say uh, to those of my constituents who might be listening today when it will be that, that my constituents such as for example those in North Queensferry will in fact be able to get direct trains around Fife during the day and when their commute to Edinburgh will be in trains where they are not packed in, like sardines. Minister. Yeah, I thank the member for her question. I have to advise that my train to work this morning was not packed like sardines. It had three carriages and plenty of seats. But nonetheless, the member and I had a very useful conversation with my officials in Transport Scotland last year. Here I am being heckled from a sedentary position. I use our uh, nationalised rail services very regularly. I would encourage other members to do likewise. Um, yeah. well said. That, in part, has led, of course, to the review of Fife Thank Service Thank you, members. I Let us hear the Minister. Thank you. welcome the input um, on behalf of our constituents the Member has had. Um, now, since the Member and I met with Transport Scotland, there have been some improvements to service provision. For example, ScotRail have advised that in period 11, which ended on 7 January, 91.7 per cent of trains arriving at or terminating at Inverkeething met the public performance measure compared with 90.9 per cent for Fife Circle trains as a whole. Notwithstanding, I am sympathetic to the specific issue in relation to the Fife Circle and timetabling for Ms Ewing's constituents. And I will ensure that ScotRail provides Ms Minister. Ewing with an update on that point when we meet next month. Question number six, Paul McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its hydrogen action plan, including regarding the role that local authorities can play in defining demand. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. In December 2022, we published our finalised hydrogen action plan, setting out the actions over the course of this Parliament necessary to support the development of the hydrogen economy in Scotland. The development of a domestic hydrogen sector and hydrogen production for export, supported by a strong supply chain, will play an important role in supporting a just transition to net zero by 2045 
and also present a significant long-term economic opportunity. We continue to work with our agency partners and local authorities to deliver on these actions. Paul McLennan. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Can I ask what role uh, sport agencies that you reference, such as HIE, Scottish Enterprise and South of Scotland Enterprise, alongside our university sector, will play alongside local authorities in developing supply chain capacity? Cabinet Secretary. I officer, our enterprise agencies and also our university sector will play a very important part in helping to build and support our hydrogen supply chain and the capacity within that sector. Uh, we work in a collaborative fashion, uh, bringing together all parts of the sector, both public, private and academic sectors, to help to support the development of the hydrogen economy. Of course, our agencies can provide grants and loans and advice to organisations that are looking to develop hydrogen proposals. And also, our enterprise agencies work with our universities to help to take forward key aspects of research which are critical to supporting the development of hydrogen projects. Thank you. Question number seven, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the possible extension of the Borders Railway through Hoyk to Carlisle. Minister Jenny Gilruth. In October 2022, the Minister for Business and I met with the Borderlands Inclusive Growth Deal Partners to discuss the Growth Deal commitment. Partners had separately asked for a meeting with the UK Government, but I understand that did not happen. Nonetheless, it was agreed that the failure of UK Government Ministers to engage at that stage was hampering progress. Scottish Ministers subsequently... Scottish Ministers subsequently wrote to our UK counterparts on the 21st of October to urge for progress on their side, and a response was received from Lord Offord of Garville and Hugh Merriman MP on the 26th of January, some three months later. Regional partners are now working to prepare costed proposals for scoping work to move forward on the possible extension of the Borders Railway to Carlisle, and my officials in Transport Scotland will continue to provide support as needed, and of course the Scottish Government commitment of up to £5 million towards this remains. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that answer. Presiding officer, campaigners are keen to see the railway extended to improve transport links to the borders and beyond and to improve our economy and give it a much needed boost. Um, would the Minister uh, agree to meet with me and the, the members of the campaign for Borders Rail to provide us with a timetable for the possible um, extension of the railway and the timetable for the feasibility study? Minister. I have met already with the, the campaign group, I think, on a number of occasions, actually. And I think the member needs to reflect that the work itself is for regional and local partners to progress and to lead on. And it's also worth remembering that the delay in progressing the commitment itself was directly impacted by the political turbulence within the United Kingdom government during 2022. Uh, and what that meant in practice was essentially that DFT officials couldn't engage as they normally would with Transport Scotland. And it is perhaps the reason that no DFT officials, of course, uh, attended the meeting that we had in October, where other partners, including Scottish ministers, were present. Notwithstanding, I recognise the significant constituency interest Ms Hamilton has. I'd be more than happy to meet with the campaign group again and her, but I cannot commit to a timescale because, of course, this work is being led by local and regional partners. It is for them to dictate the timescale in that respect. Question number eight, Evelyn Tweed. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of Brexit on investment in Scotland, in light of reports that Brexit has cost the UK economy £29 billion in lost investment. Cabinet Secretary Angus Robertson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. It, it is not surprising that investment has underperformed since the Brexit referendum. Many businesses in Scotland continue to report additional challenges, barriers and trade costs due to Brexit, and this inevitably will act as a constraint on business investment in Scotland. Previous Scottish Government analysis has shown that Scotland's business investment could be 7.7 per cent lower in the long run due to Brexit. Evelyn Tweed. Can the Cabinet Secretary name one benefit to Scotland of Brexit? Because I can't. Cabinet Secretary? Uh, no, I, I can't think of any advantages uh, either. Uh, this government... <clears throat> Thank you. This government uh, warned before the EU referendum that Brexit would cause significant economic and social harm to Scotland, and so it has proved. The fact is there are no benefits to be had from Brexit imposed on us against our democratic will, which is one reason why Scotland needs to be able to choose our own future in an independence referendum. 